Today we're going to have three speakers, Keith, Peg, Marie. I'll tell you who they are now. Settle down. <laughs> Everything you hear and see today is the responsibility of our guest and does not necessarily reflect the manliest and foreign, <laughs> manliest library, or the manliest center, center's view of the subject. However, I will not be surprised their thoughts and mine are reasonably congruent. A super duper welcome to our guests. Let's start the conversation in this way. What went right and what went wrong? <coughs> What, well, what do you mean, with the media, or? <laughs> that we could be here all day. Well, I know. So let's say, what went right so far since January 20th, and what has gone wrong since January 20th? Forget about the, 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 the run-up. I mean, from day one, when whoever that fellow was with the yellow hair went into the White House, what went right so far? Well, I think the media uh, was knocked back by the result of the election, the failure to see it coming, and therefore uh, has done quite a bit of soul searching and retrenchment about and thinking about how we cover politics. So, uh, you know, that's been a good thing. Uh, there's been a lot more coverage of uh, what was derisively called flyover country during the campaign, you know, the middle of America where a lot of disaffection and uh, economic dislocation was happening. You see uh, media outlets like the New York Times, the Washington Post, and others uh, trying, to do, trying to get more conservative opinions in their, in their mix. Uh, the Times famously just hired Brett Stevens from the Wall Street Journal, who's already created a firestorm. Uh, you know, from the other side, I think the Trump administration has undertaken a uh, concerted uh, effort to delegitimate delegitimize the media. Uh, the, the, the attacks started on day two with Trump's speech at the CIA where he ranted about uh, the dishonest media and coverage of the inaugural crowds. And that, you know, the Sean Spicer picked it up from there with the disastrous briefing on day two. And, you know, you could, I could go through alternative facts, uh, you know, fake news, lying New York Times, uh, on and on and on. The, the president has tweeted 109 times about the media since day one. The most of any of his tweets are about the media. Um, and then on day 101, there was a trifecta with uh, Reince, Pre Reince Priebus saying, uh, we might look into undoing the First Amendment. And the uh, president, uh, well, I can't remember, no, I, I wrote this down, what happened on day 101. I had, I, it was, it's such a long list. MediaMatters.org is keeping a running tally of all the attacks on the media, if you're interested. Um, anyway, there's the overturning the First Amendment. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, Trump calling CBS Morning News face the nation, deface the nation, right to the host's face, so poor John Dickerson. And then uh, Spicer repeatedly defending various Trump attacks on news organizations. Uh, CNN, CNN also has uh, rejected an ad calling itself fake news. So, I mean, the, 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 the antagonism is supposed to be there. That's the role of the media. Uh, I think Trump has taken it to a, a whole new level. And I guess I wanted to say that I think Trump is learning the difference between campaigning and governing, uh, which... Uh, I think if you, uh, uh, what I do is profile the leaders using their words in a software program called Leadership Trait Analysis. Uh, and if you look at what he was doing during the campaign, he was using the media, but he also had a lot of other people that he could play off of. And now he's the only one. And I think that has kind of brought him up straight. 
he has a great desire to control every single situation. And he thought when he got elected president of the United States that we really had an authoritarian system so that he could say something and it would happen, that he was the decision maker. And I think it's interesting that one of his uh, close friends was asked by a reporter, what do you think Trump has learned during this first 100 days? And his comment was, how to hate Congress. And I think to some extent, he's also learned about the Constitution and the checks and balances. Uh, and it's been very <coughs> frustrating because I teach leadership and one of the problems for political leaders is this thing we call mediated leadership, which means most of what they do is interpreted by the media, by somebody else, uh, by opinion leaders, uh, by Congress. Uh, and it's very hard to kind of get themselves out there. And so you see the tweets, you see the try to use the media, you see him try to always be out in front because that gives him control. But in the campaign, that paid off. For governing, he switches positions, he moves with such a fast rate that in effect we can't keep up with him and we wonder what's going on. And it, it's almost like could he learn that he can have more control, actually, if he retreats a little behind the scenes and lets some other people out in front. The problem is he has to be in control. So he, if the people are going to be out in front, they can't, like Steve Bannon, put themselves on the Time magazine cover. Uh, they have to always say something nice about Donald Trump and then go on and do what they think should be done. But it's an interesting situation. Presidents always, when they go into the White House, realize how little control they have. And generally you see in the second administration of a president them pulling everything in to the White House or putting their people in as Secretary of Defense or Secretary of State so they can have more control because Donald Trump needs it so completely. Think about the fact that he ran a one person, really, company. He could switch the people that worked with him any time. And his three behaviors were sue, uh, leave, or bully. And I think one of the, the times we really saw him at what he is usually like was when the health care bill, they withdrew it the first time around and he was kind of captured by the media, and he said, well, we'll just move on. And to some extent, that's been his modus operandi uh, across time. But it's hard to move on when people believe in health care, when there are things that need to be done. And so I think, really, these first 100 days have been a learning arena for him, and he's frustrated as heck. So let's figure out how quickly he can learn. He's 70 years old. We 70 year olds can learn pretty quickly, can't we? All of you in this room can do that uh, and can change your behavior in response to the environment. Let's see if he can. Um, I, I don't know if you all saw it, but on Monday of this week, uh, the Trump camp campaign, picking off on Peg's thing between campaigning and governing, uh, issued its first ad. So the uh, first campaign ad came out on Monday, and, and it was about the 100 days of measure. So uh, the Trump administration has simultaneously rejected 100 days as a useful metric for success and graded itself with an A for the 100 days. So it simultaneously played both sides. The ad, I think, is interesting because it tells you from the perspective of the Trump administration what the successes have been in the first 100 days. And the very first thing mentioned in that ad is the uh, successful uh, installment of uh, Justice Gorsuch on the Supreme Court. Um, so I think that's one thing that they point to as, as a real win. Uh, and uh, Gorsuch is, has been rated by various legal academics and political scientists will attempt to identify the ideology of justices. And there are different methods for doing this. One is to look at past votes if you've been a judge. 
Another is to do content analysis of uh, media coverage of a nominee to see if it's being covered as a liberal or as a conservative candidate. By both measures, uh, Justice Gorsuch is uh, more conservative than uh, Justice Antonin Scalia, uh, the justice that he's replacing. Um, it's hard to really sort of say what that means because his votes are on circuit court rather than the Supreme Court and different rules apply to the circuit court. For example, there are, there are rules uh, that require recusal on uh, circuit courts in cases of conflict of interest. There are no such rules in the Supreme Court. Uh, the Supreme Court uh, justices in the 1990s, there was a letter written uh, that they all signed saying, we'll be good, we'll be ethical, um, and a number of those justices are no longer even on the bench. So there, there are no rules other than impeachment that controls the behavior of Supreme Court justices. So I'm certain we won't see Justice Gorsuch recusing himself from decisions as often as he did when he sat on the Tenth Circuit. Uh, but in what way is he more conservative than Scalia? I think that's something to keep in mind. I mean, what could that mean, right? Scalia and, and, and Justice Thomas, very conservative justices. Uh, by some measures, uh, some of the most conservative justices that have ever served on the Supreme Court. So what does it mean to say he's more conservative? And uh, I think what people were talking about was uh, his position on a case called Chevron. Now, it's an administrative law case, and even I find it boring. So I'm not <laughs> going to go into the details of it. But it is interesting because it suggests how there can be different kinds of conservatism, um, particularly different kinds of judicial conservatism, and there can be difference between a Scalia and a Gorsuch. Well, what is that difference? Justice Scalia, his early experience was in uh, the executive branch. He worked in the administration, um, and he came up at a time uh, when Republicans uh, were in control consistently of the presidency. Uh, so not only Nixon and then Ford, a brief period of Carter, but then you had the Reagan-Bush years. And uh, Scalia, perhaps reflecting that experience, was uh, very deferential to agency rulemaking, executive bureaucracy rulemaking. And the Chevron rule is about the courts deferring to uh, bureaucratic rulemaking. The idea being that experts, say in the Environmental Protection Agency, know more about how to uh, clean up the environment than, say, federal judges do. Gorsuch has raised questions about such deference. And this dates back to a very old opposition to the rise of the regulatory state that dates back at least to the New Deal. Uh, in the 1930s, many conservatives then that were opposed to the growth of government uh, thought that the courts could be used as a way of preventing federal bureaucracy from growing. In fact, the argument was that the executive branch, beyond those units that are mentioned in the Constitution, is unconstitutional. So, Department of Labor, Environmental Protection Agency, um, all of these would be unconstitutional. So, how do you get them declared unconstitutional, you say that creating them is unconstitutionally delegating lawmaking authority from Congress to the executive branch. So Justice Gorsuch is more conservative than Scalia in the sense that he is on board with, at least has expressed some sympathy, not only in his opinions, but in his extrajudicial speeches and writing, uh, with this project of enlisting the judiciary to constrain um, and ultimately dismantle, if successful, uh, the regulatory state, the administrative state. Right? So that's the regulatory state that put the exit signs on these doors, where they are. That's the regulatory state that determined the width of these doors. Uh, right? This is the regulatory state that is in all aspects of our lives. Uh, so when you think about the success, and again, I think everybody would say there's success for the Trump administration, getting their nominee onto the Supreme Court, um, what kind of nominee is he? Of course, he's only one of nine, right? So he's on the court doesn't mean he can dictate things, but uh, installing a conservative jurist who's conservative arguably in a new way uh, than we've seen on the high court to date. Let, uh, let me ask you though, Keith. Yes. Uh, <laughs> he did that, actually, wasn't that really McConnell? that got Gorsuch, <laughs> Gorsuch onto the court right. well, by changing the rules of right. the Senate, which yeah. is another interesting. Yeah. Well, if you watch the commercial pick, it was all Donald Trump. Trump. Yeah. <laughs> and this is the control, yeah. 
which he wants to be. No, and that's significant. I mean, of course, that, that's absolutely right, right? The way he got onto the bench was that the, Supreme, uh, the Senate ended up changing its own rules, right? Or rather, technically, the rules have not changed. The Senate changed the way they interpret their own rules. Right. Um, so they <laughs> now no longer interpret their rules so that uh, you, you, can be, you can put someone on the Supreme Court with just a simple majority. And, uh, and, and going beyond that, right, it's just that we have to look back a year where uh, Senator uh, McConnell, Majority Leader, refused to uh, advance Merrick Garland, who was President Obama's nominee uh, for the open seat. Um, and so, yes, it was the work of many hands. But interestingly, it's, it's being held out uh, by the Trump campaign because they've already raised more money at this stage for 2020 than um, the president said. Yeah, I mean, they're, he's, on, he's looking towards the next election very seriously. So the Trump campaign understands this to be their victory. Um, so, I, but yes, there are other people and, and other things going on. Uh, it, may I just yeah. have to turn it on? Uh, it's, it's, uh, uh, it, it may be that this is the, the victory they're pointing to because they don't have any legislative victories to point to. I mean, with Congress, with all the leaders of Congress being controlled by Republicans, I think Trump, to Peg's point, thought that it would be easier to get a lot of stuff done in the first 100 days. And, and this, you know, the fact that Gorsuch is the only legislative achievement, I think, is <laughs> the reason that it's number one, because it's the only, only. The only one. <laughs> How and what, how, you basically you answered this. Let me point out something. When I saw that ad on Monday morning, I was flabbergasted. That ad had to be put together in sometime in the middle of March, okay? It had to build up, and they knew what they were doing. They wanted to run it on that Monday, which was the 101st day or the 102nd day, and whatever. And it's interesting that he had to use the media to get the message across. I mean, he, I better be careful how we say this. He's got to choose what, where his head is. Is it, I need the media, or I don't need the media? He needed the media. <laughs> well, he, he craves the media's a, a approval. At the same time, he bashes the media. It's... It's a duality, you just, it, that's just Trump. But, but, also, but also, think about this. In effect, in the campaign, he literally kept control of the subject matter that was going on among the Republican candidates first in getting that nomination, and then between himself and Hillary. Now he has nobody that he is really against. So he's got to find all of these things. <laughs> enemy of the people. Enemy, enemy of the people, but, but he also has to find individuals. So Schumer sometimes is it. Hillary's gonna become it after her interactions yesterday. Uh, because, and I think this is one of the interesting things, he's one of the very few presidents who has not reached out after the election to those who voted against him. And one of the interesting things when you look at his profile uh, as a leader is that leave, bully, or sue. There has always been an opposition. So he's got to find it because that's the way he gains control. And this is the notion I was talking about, about mediation, that there are always, for a president, going to be somebody else interpreting him. And that it makes it very difficult for a president to actually get his message across. So he goes quickly out to as many news people as he can get because he feels like from the campaign that gives him control. I think it doesn't in the White House. Uh, because it gives more people a chance to reinterpret him in a mediated way. And I think that's what he's going to learn, or the people around him are going to have to help him learn. Who were the losers in the first 104 days, and why? And if you, the other part that I had is, who were the losers, and who were the winners in the first 
140 and why? Uh, I, I would just reach you for the microphone. Uh, but, uh, I, you know, I, I'll actually, so on the, I don't know if this is a winner or a loser, and I think maybe I'd love to hear what my co-panelists say, and that is about um, media, if you think about the news media, one element of um, a professional practice is verification. So just what are the facts, right? Just and if you can think about um, uh, the practice of news journalism, a lot of it is being fair to the facts, right? Um, trying to get multiple sources to confirm what's actually happening. So one of the functions that the media plays, and this is related to, but independent or different from, it's watchdog role. Watchdog role checking uh, those who are in power, making sure they're using power responsibly. Um, but verification is just what's happening. And uh, there's a starting, uh, it really picked up steam after a while in the presidential campaign as the news media started to pay more attention to verification and engage in relentless fact checking. So uh, I saw this campaign ad twice. One was just seeing it, it was online, it's easy to find. Um, another was the New York Times ran it and simultaneously fact checked it. So it's like a 30 second ad, but on the New York Times it runs for a minute and 30 seconds, it stops it after each claim and so is this true or not? And this fact checking you just sort of see all over the place. And I, I guess I'm unclear in my own mind whether this enhanced emphasis on fact checking has been a win for the media or a loss. Because in a sense, it, we have the media, news media, much more focused on just verifying what's happening in real time. On the other hand, the fact checking seems to feed right into uh, Trump administration's, Trump himself, need for an enemy, right? And uh, he can point to the fact checking, uh, it's just like, that already shows you're against me, right? The fact that you, that you need to verify every claim I make, right? And say, it's a nice day today, fact check. Is it a nice day today, right? That shows that you're already against me. So I don't know on winners and losers whether the renewed emphasis on verification has made the media a winner or the media a loser. And I'd just be interested to hear what two of you have to say. Well, I, I think it's both. I, I think the people are turning to places like the Washington Post fact checker and PolitiFact and others to, you know, and Snopes to a certain extent to, 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 to try to make sense of what Trump is saying and how it uh, stacks up. I think we're a loser in that people don't always believe facts. We, we, we've now lost, I think we've lost a common definition of the facts. There used to be that we would have, you know, we would, we would even, even if we were politically on different sides, we would be able to have an agreed upon body of fact with which to conduct our debate. And, you know, I think there, the reason, <laughs> there's a reason that Merriam-Webster picked post-truth as the word of 2016 because I think we, we may be entering a post-truth society where the facts really don't matter. People decide which facts they want to, they cherry pick which ones they want to believe and which ones they don't. And, uh, and so that's definitely a, uh, a losing battle for the media if, we're, if we're, we, we don't, we, if we can't have an agreed upon I, a body of ideas of what, what is a fact and what, what is true and what is not. And it's all opinion. Uh, that's a very dangerous thing. And you know, I think it's on. Uh, one of the interesting things uh, that this, can you, uh, is it on or not? Yeah. Uh, is that one? Let me, let me. Is that better? Yeah. That's better. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, one of the things that uh, the social media has done uh, is if you think about pol political problems, they're very ill structured. That's one of the things I think. May, draws politicians into actually uh, entering that particular uh, profession is they're <coughs> ill-structured because there's no right or wrong answer. Uh, and in effect what we're doing in dealing with these problems, we're arguing over <coughs> what we think is right and what we think is wrong. And in 1991, when we went into uh, Kuwait and uh, and actually began bombing in Iraq. And remember CNN had two 
media reporters who hid under the bed. That was the first time that the media was unfiltered. And in effect, you were getting straight from the source. And since 1991, and then with the growth of social media, you're getting everybody's opinions. Uh, and as Daniel Patrick Moynihan said, everybody's entitled their own opinions, but not their own facts. But we're forgetting that. And because the problems are ill-structured, we're all in the mix of deciding how we want this thing to be settled. And I think this is one of the, also the frustrations that uh, Trump has and why he uses the tweets is he keeps thinking he has the right idea. But the rest of us, looking at our environments, our experience, think we've got it too. And so there's debate and discussion, probably at a rate we've never had it before. But then it seems like there are no real facts, doesn't it? There, and so your comment about agreed upon facts is kind of where we're all going. And I think that's one of the dilemmas that's come out of this election uh, and uh, is going to keep us going with President Trump. Because no politician can ever be free to really say what they think that won't be picked up by social media. And they learn this so quickly which is very frustrating because then they're always painting the picture that they want us to believe, but never being able to be actually forthright because we're always in a selling mode as to just what we think is right or wrong. And on 9-11, on I was in London, 9-11-2001, I was in London, England, at been at a conference, and I was in the British Museum. And at 2.45 in the afternoon, there was this announcement saying, if you are an American, go to the nearest pub. Something terrible's happening in your country. We thought the British were trying to pull the wool over our eyes and get us to buy Guinness at the nearest pub. <laughs> but the issue was, as soon as we got to that pub, Tony Blair made this long speech at the Labor Party conference, and he said, what is happening in New York City is a crime against civilization. We will use the rule of law, and we will use the police, and we will bring these criminals to justice. It took me a week to get back to the United States. When I got back here, I learned that what had happened in New York City was an attack on America, that we were at war on terror, and it was a highly nationalistic event. We're going to use our military to deal with this. Now, folks, that is exactly the same event being interpreted in very, framed in very different ways. And President Obama tried to close Guantanamo Bay, but it's a prisoner of war base. That's a different thing than if it were actually a prison for criminals. So how the leaders frame tends to help us make a decision as to how we're going to go right or wrong. And now with all of the social media, all the diverse kinds of media and information, how do you make a decision of what's right or wrong? I, we, have, we have one live mic here. Uh, so um, I think to pick up on, on what Peg was saying about uh, what's right or wrong and um, I think we often think of the media, and certainly uh, interviews with many news media professionals will tell you that the function of the news media is to inform us, right? so that we get the information that we need so that we can make decisions about our lives. It can be mundane decisions of just how to negotiate life in the city or where a good restaurant is, but more broadly, how to you know, practice responsible self-government. But it's always been the case that the media doesn't just inform, it also becomes a basis for us to identify um, and create a sense of community. If you look back to, you know, there was a period in time when we were all uh, British colonists, and then we became <coughs> Americans during the revolution. And how did that happen? Part of the way that happened was the dissemination of newspapers and pamphlets that allowed people to, colonists, to imagine themselves all part of one community, a new community called Americans. And media has played this role uh, throughout the world, throughout the globe. Many nationalist revolutions are often preceded by 
the rise of a shared news outlet. Sometimes this can take place around an important novel or play. Any kind of print media can become a basis for forming uh, an identity. So if we go forward to today, it's not just that people are framing the same facts in different ways and therefore not having a same set of agreed upon facts, but that people are using um, the media to make statements of identity. So one of the most important aspects of fake news, and I don't mean fake news in the Trumpian sense, which is news he doesn't like, but I mean fake news in the original sense that it was used in the campaign, which is to reinforce communal identity. Uh, it's not so much that you read the whole article saying that the Pope has endorsed Donald Trump for the president, but that you share it. Uh, you share it with uh, people in your circle, your friends, your social network, and you're reaffirming an identity. Uh, we're people who we all agree, we can, this is stuff, we're all reading this, we're consuming the same information, we're all part of the same team. And I think this is what makes these uh, information bubbles, really, the walls of these bubbles are very thick, because it's not just like I can present you with an alternative set of facts <laughs> and persuade you that uh, something else is going on, because we're invested in our facts as almost a statement of identity. And it's very troubling, because people have been doing this for a very long time. I mean, as long as there's been print media. The best you can hope for is that there's widely shared print media that helps us invest in a more universal uh, kind of identity. But I think it's a mistake to think that it's just a matter of people being misinformed and not getting enough news. Uh, people approach the news not just for facts, but approach the news because it helps them uh, establish and maintain a sense of identity. And this isn't just one segment of people or one party. We all do this. This is ubiquitous. And so it's not, a, it's not an easy dynamic to reverse uh, once, it, once it gets set in a particular way. And I think that's one thing that went on with fake news. It's not just misinformation. It was part of a identity formation and maintenance. Um, and it's continuing today. Uh, there, I, I know that the, the New York Times uh, slayed a couple of outlets run a weekly column now trying to cover the news in, um, in partisan media. And it's useful in part because you see what the emphasis is. But you can also see the process of active identity construction and community maintenance. So. I think it's only going to get worse as the media uh, atomizes further. Uh, you know, we've, we've, we've now lost a whole body of you know, uh, print media, regional newspapers, local newspapers, and we still have a local newspaper here, uh, and we're doing our best to keep going. Uh, but the digital revolution has really uh, uh, undercut the financial model for print journalism, and, uh, and so you see you know, where well-funded places like the Washington Post, who has a, happens to have a billionaire owner, uh, you know, they're doing great stuff, but is he making any money doing it? I, I don't know. The, the, the New York Times today reported their first quarter results. Uh, their subscriptions are up 308,000, but their print advertising revenue is down 17%. So uh, this, this financial difficulty that the, the media business finds itself in is, is not going to go away, and, uh, and I think we're going to have to try to make sense of the, uh, the media anarchy, as uh, Susan Glasser of Politico calls it. Well, I think it's also interesting that uh, in the United States we tend to choose places to live that, uh, where there are people that are like us. Uh, and so, in effect, it makes gerrymandering a little more, a little easier to do. But if you think about Facebook, you think about the friends, uh, you think about kind of closing yourselves in to a particular network. Uh, on the day after the election, I was teaching political leadership and each of the students was studying a political leader and one of the students had Donald Trump that he was studying. And he called me at six in the morning and he said, Professor Herman, he was supposed to give a report on Trump that day. He said, I don't think I should do this. Everybody in the room will be angry at me. 
And I said, how do you know everybody in the room will be angry at you? And he said, well, I'm sure they're all Democrats. And I said, how do you know that? Uh, and I said, let's, let's have you do this presentation, and then let's have a conversation. And one of the fascinating things about that conversation, because he did a very good job of actually analyzing, thinking about what Trump had been doing, but one of the effects of the conversation was all of the students began realizing the particular niches, information niches, that they were caught in and how they were not stretching beyond a certain, so they weren't seeing the range of thought that they as students should be doing because isn't an education uh, supposed to kind of introduce you to all sides of an issue and they were not looking for all sides of the issue. So I think to some extent we also bear some responsibility for trying to figure out what the range is, what are the, the points along this continuum, and what are agreed upon facts? Yeah, do you want to yeah. take questions? Um, yeah, let's start off with a, what they call a Q&A, and I'm sure there's some questions, and probably you, there's people who have questions, they have their own answers. But you, uh, you're more than welcome to raise your hand, Speak up. Hold on. Questions only, guys. Don't express opinions. Ask the question. Okay? Let's get the format straight off. I've gone through this dance a couple of times. So please, just questions and no opinions. Go. Okay. Well, stand up and ask your question. Uh, given everything you just said and the tendency of, uh, uh, well, the reality that, that each individual's uh, preconceptions about what constitute facts are reinforced by the media that they access and, uh, and other sources of information, uh, what do you envision would be the point at which, trigger point at which a group would lose faith in the uh, in, in the beliefs that they adhere to, if their individual self-interest uh, was so adversely, actually realistically harmed, so as to possibly move them off this this tendency to believe alternative facts, for example. So, for example, the 98 percent of of, of uh, Trump-based supporters who continue to support him, regardless of what's happened, they are still with him. What would actually have to happen? for there to be an erosion of that support. What, uh, let me rephrase that a bit. What you're basically asking is, what has to happen? What does he have to do, he? What does he have to do to lose that 40%? Is that basically yeah. the question? Yes. I'd like to see him go play golf Actually, some day and go stop it, but that's beside the point. I think one thing that's important to keep in mind is that the, the questions that get asked in our public life, um, it's not like just an open-ended inquiry or exploration. Um, our debates are structured and framed. And we, uh, we, we see this happening, for example, in the election, uh, that um, the debate gets built in a certain way, so certain questions are asked and the electorate is divided along certain axes. So, for example, um, the you know, largest segment of, of working class jobs, I believe right now is a, a home health care aid. Uh, but that's not how working class job was defined in the campaign. It was instead tied to either manufacturing or natural resource uh, production like coal mining. Those were working class jobs. The, the reality is that those are a very, there are more people that work for uh, the fast food chain Hardee's than do coal mining in the entire United States. So that's, you'd say, well, that's a fact, right? That's the reality. The reality is that we have a working class set of jobs, right, that are defined by, say, a certain set of wages and the kind of qualifications one needs to labor in that sector, um, and yet that's not how it's portrayed. Uh, and I think the reason why it's portrayed in a particular way, rather than in a way that's just sort of broadly representative of the reality, 
is because uh, political elites and organizations, this is campaigns and parties, uh, structure the debate in a particular way, so we ask certain kinds of questions. You know, I think it was, it was a large percentage of the electorate did not even turn out and vote in this election. Now, why didn't they turn out and vote? Uh, well, it's not easy to vote in the United States, right? I mean, many other countries make it a lot easier. That's not an accident that it's not easy to vote in the United States. It serves the interests of both political parties to make it difficult to vote, depending what part of the country you're in. Uh, but we have a lot of people who feel like it doesn't matter. Why do they feel like it doesn't matter? Because the questions that are asked in our public affairs are not questions that are relevant to their lives. Well, why aren't relevant questions asked? Because of the way in which the debate is structured and organized. And so I think it's, um, it's kind of dispiriting that people remain attached to a particular point of view regardless of what happens, right? So it's like, what would it take? What kind of failure would be necessary for people to regret their vote? Well, I think it would take not only, in my view, um, some kinds of mistakes and missteps, it would also take a reorganization of what we're arguing about. We'd have to divide along a different sort of axis so we can raise new sorts of questions. Now, one effective agent for redefining the debate and identifying new axes historically has been the media. But as we were just saying, the fragmentation and atomization of the media coupled with this dynamic where we, we curate our own media consumption, so we get our own facts and we reinforce our own identity, makes it less likely that any kind of media is gonna come in and help us realign the debate. So I don't know, it would take something big, I guess is my answer to your question. So aren't you glad I had that long wind up? <laughs> and now the pitch comes dribbling to the plate on the ground. Um, but let me pass it to my colleagues. Well, and I actually come from coal country in Kentucky, grew up there, uh, actually went with my dad on the Frontier Nursing Service in Eastern Kentucky. And to some extent, folks, we have challenged those people, right? Trump actually came out and told them he was gonna help them. And now all the media and the rest of us are saying, you guys just give up on what Trump wants to do. He's not gonna do it for you. And in effect, have you ever been challenged? Uh, have your opinions ever been challenged so you want to hold them tighter? And I think that's part of the dilemma. I wish that Trump had started with infrastructure, actually, because I think that's where we all come together much more dramatically, and it facilitates getting some of the jobs for the people that are in the coal country. Uh, but, you know, we have to also put ourselves in their shoes and they've all of a sudden got a savior. And yet we in the media and at the other 50% of the country are saying, you should give up on him. He's terrible. He's not going to do anything. And I think that just drives us right, drives those people right back into the corner. I think it's going to take some kind of a uh, constitutional crisis um, you know, the author authoritarian impulses of this president are are beginning to show. He's embraced uh, autocrats around the world. Um, right, and, and uh, you know, said he wants to change the rules of the Senate, says he wants to undo the First Amendment. I mean, right now it's, he, well, he says he wants to do a lot of things, and I think the media's challenge is to is to uh, watch what he does, not what he says. Although, it, when the president speaks, it has quite a bit of weight. But uh, I'm hoping that uh, it won't go, won't go this far. But if there is some real threat to per civil liberties or uh, the First Amendment, freedom of speech, uh, freedom of assembly, uh, that, there, that the people will wake up and and say, wait a minute, this is not what I voted for. You know, there, there's a great amount of trust in, in the president that he's going to do what he says he wants, wants to do. Um, and he survived a campaign where many things that would have derailed other candidates did not derail him. So trust and accountability have been uh, decoupled here. And uh, I, th I think the public really ought to think hard about, you know, our country, I, I, Roger Sharp has written a few things for our, uh, our paper. He's a historian from, uh, from the Maxwell School. 
And he says, uh, you know, that we shouldn't be complacent about our the, the future of our country. That it, it's it's not guaranteed that it's going to persist. That it, it only has persisted this long because people defended it, and have protected the liberties that our founding fathers um, put forth in the Constitution. Melvin, uh, the fact that he's filled such a small percentage of positions in the State Department proves the authoritarian point, I think. He just doesn't want to have to answer to so many people or get some, he wants his idea and that's it. It's very dangerous. What can we do about that? Well, but think about it. Uh, the, yeah, the, the question was, why hasn't he filled the positions in the State Department and the Defense Department? And what can we do about it? And what can we do about it? And I think this is where the control comes in. He was the CEO of his company. He was his company. So he believes somebody should be able to run the State Department. Tillerson was the CEO of ExxonMobil. And Mattis has run a large portion of the U.S. military. And they shouldn't have to report to other people, and sh they shouldn't need to report to other people. So to some extent, he's putting on to those two agencies his own view of how leadership works. But I think actually one of the successes here is the National Security Council. I actually think Tillerson and Mattis uh, are working very closely with the National Security Council. And we want them to have successes. So the Syria reaction was to some extent, the, the use of the missiles is to some extent a positive move. And when, when Trump gets those positive reactions, he's more likely to trust the people that have helped him make those and have those successes. And that's why I think we, you know, if I were in that White House, I would be buttering him up, but also, trying to get him to see the nuances. Because one of the things, he's extraordinarily black and white, which means he misses the nuances. Decisive, but misses the nuances. So get him to see those nuances. And I think some of the people actually in the NSC are beginning to do this. I think there's, well, I was just gonna chip in on this just because I think it's at least a question for me, and I don't know what the answer is, when we observe something like failure to staff the State Department, or basically to run the whole entire administration with a skeleton crew, right? Uh, sometimes that's interpreted, in a, and I think certainly there's a view of Bannon, that this was an effort to deconstruct the administrative state, right? This is a way of trying to, um, essentially, uh, an alternative mechanism. On the one hand, you've got Gorshitz over here, who's raising questions about the constitutionality of the right of the administrative state, and then in the administration itself, they're trying to attack it from the top by not staffing it. Um, but you know, another explanation is they're just disorganized. Uh, the there was a transition plan that was uh, spearheaded by Chris Christie of Bridgegate fame, um, and that was in place and that was fairly well developed, and then was discarded uh, after the election. And so they came in to office. Uh, with much, I mean, the plans were, were very poorly developed. Trump himself has a very small circle that he relied on throughout the campaign, and he rotated people out of that circle, right? I mean, you have Paul Manafort who came in who was supposed to make Trump look presidential. That was in, that was about this time last year. Um, and, you know, so sometimes I think it's, yes, we can think about what is the objective that is expressed through the failure to have staffing. Um, but there also just seems to be an element of, of disorganization. And I think that there, the jury's still out as to whether there's some <coughs> plan afoot or, or it's the complete lack of ability to plan that's afoot. But also think about, uh, have any of you been in the bureaucracy in DC? Because there is a big divide between the appointed officials and those who have been civil servants for a long period of time. And my own experiences with those civil servants, that often they will do what they think <coughs> is correct behavior, and by not having people at the top, sometimes that facilitates the actual movement on issues that they couldn't do with a large number of appointed officials. Now, I'd like to see some more 
people, the deputies at least, Trump has said no to Tillerson and Mattis on several deputies that they have wanted to have. Uh, and they're going to have to push in this area too. But one of the interesting things, and I think we need to watch this budget bill, because it turns out that the secretaries and then cabinet officials have really two bosses. One is Congress and one is Trump. And when the money starts coming, and when they have to go to Congress to start pushing for things, then in effect, you're gonna to begin to see, I think, them start pushing Trump uh, and moving in different directions because they really got two masters. Now, he can dismiss them, but that's gonna be a little harder to do than he thinks. Just a follow-up. Maxwell School, with its expertise, long distance the Moynihan Department. I understand there's an office in Washington has the National School had any input on what's going on there? Uh, yeah. I mean, um, Sean O'Keefe, who's uh, one of the professors of practice at the Maxwell School, or he, I forget his exact title, but he's a professor at the Maxwell School, and he has served in presidential administrations. He was part of a transition team that was there to provide advice on how to actually go about staffing in an efficient manner. And uh, he was part of a presentation that was done earlier uh, in the spring semester on the Trump administration. Um, and I think his view, and I don't want to put words in his mouth, but that uh, he felt that their advice was completely disregarded. So the Maxwell School at the center of it is uh, training in public management, nonprofit management. This is the expertise of many of the faculty. And that expertise was uh, made available in an official way. Uh, this was, uh, I think, the maybe the second time, this might have happened in the Obama administration, where you had this team of experts, nonpartisan fashion, just trying to advise uh, the incoming administration about how to engage in staffing and management, and that it just was a complete waste of time. So there's been an, there has been an effort, and Maxwell's represented, I think, in that effort, uh, but to my knowledge, so far, it's, it's not had an effect. Um, well, and Maxwell, think about it. The Maxwell School has the largest number of people actually in the civil service and in the management of the bureaucracy. Okay, so and there's a saying. real and there's a real difference between the appointed uh, officials in that bureaucracy that come and go with the president and those that are below who stay across time. And we have a largest number in the SES, which is the kind of senior executive service. Uh, and that's why I have great faith in them <laughs> and their training as they move forward. Uh, but, but it's a different art and experience and influence is at a different level. And the, the debates between appointed and civil servants it's a really difficult position to be in. I think about Colin Powell, very interesting person. He was Secretary of State under George W. Bush, had no influence on American foreign policy because he was cut out, but he did an enormous amount in staffing and in working out the issues and dilemmas of the State Department. So one of the things that we often see is that the cabinet officials and the appointed officials have more effect maybe on shaping the policies but not on implementing the policies. And I don't know if you've ever played this children's game where I start a word and then we make it go all the way through the audience and if it comes out even close to the word <laughs> over here, you're surprised. And one of the dilemmas all political leaders learn is they can make decisions but they can't implement them. Or they're not the persons who implement them. Marlena? I have a question for Marie. How does the paper choose what um, conservative sources to draw from? The, there was something in the paper in the opinion page on Sunday um, which drew a reaction, a, a letter, probably several, they, one of which you uh, printed yesterday. Um, you use the it looks like the Tribune news service um, to 
on the opinion page to put something. So I just wonder what process you go through to choose to you know make that determination. Right. It's not always me. Uh, yes. the, pe the people the who uh, put the paper out are choosing, um, but we have access to the Washington Post, Bloomberg News Service, uh, we, the Tribune News Service, the Associated Press, the New York Times. So these are these are syndication services that we subscribe to, we pay for, and uh, and there's uh, a concerted effort to balance conservative and liberal. Uh, the Washington Post recently added Mark Thiessen and uh, Ed Rogers and Hugh Hewitt to their line, their uh, opinion lineup to make the, you know, it was some, some of them are just writing only for the web, but they're available to us to use in the, on the web or in print. Uh, so I, I do think that there's, and as I mentioned before, Brett Steubens has just joined the New York Times. Um, so I think there is uh, the, the media uh, writ large and also in our own shop, we are uh, making a conscious effort to seek out opinions from various viewpoints. Before we go to that, I'd like to address another subject. Can't hear you. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh. I think I've used that one. All right, yeah. the Before. Before, again, one of the questions that I thought about was this. How and what has been accomplished or not accomplished these 104 days affect the business world, the business climate? And how you roll this thing out, it's always about the money. So address how he, he the president, has decision made and how it affects the business climate. Um, as I may have mentioned, I saw this ad um, <laughs> at the beginning of the week. Uh, the second uh, achievement of the Trump administration from the Trump perspective uh, was eliminating a number of uh, rules that kill business growth. And uh, the elimination of these rules is kind of interesting. It, it didn't happen through executive order. Uh, and that, that gets a lot of coverage. For example, the Trump signing the order that had a temporary ban on uh, travel from Muslim, seven Muslim-majority countries. Uh, there have been executive orders um, reinstituting pipelines, executive orders changing rules for the EPA. But there, there have been, I think it's 13 bills that have been signed. Congress has a piece of legislation that allows um, it within 60 legislative days, so that's not the same as normal solar days, uh, Congress can uh, pass, both House of Congress have to do it by majority vote, and the President has to sign it, they can actually reverse a, a, a bureaucratic rule. To otherwise reverse or change a rule is very cumbersome because there's a long process of notice, you have to have a period of comment from the public, and due deliberation, that's not something that can be done quickly. But if you act within 60 legislative days of the announcement or promulgation of the rule, you can reverse it through this uh, by going through the House, the Senate, and the President. And so this is one instance where uh, the Trump has worked with Congress. And in, uh, these are very specific set of rules, and it's only ones that are the recent. They came right at the end of the Obama administration. They were announced by various different agencies. So the argument is, is that the reversal of those regulations uh, will um, help business. I mean, I think the, the question you have to ask is, that if you look at the size of the federal bureaucracy and the number of rules that are announced all the time, you have you know, 13 versus, I don't know, hundreds of thousands of, of, of rules. And so, uh, you know, I mean, a little bit, is, a lot of this is in the eye of the beholder, uh, whether these particular rules make a difference. I don't think you're gonna see um, significant business-friendly action until you see substantive congressional legislation that is signed by the president uh, into law. But there have been these 100 days, which is I guess what we're talking about, the 104 days, there have been these very targeted specific efforts to reverse the rules that were recent enough that they were available for reversal under this legislative mechanism. 
So it's kind of down in the weeds, but it's worth thinking about, right? These are the top two achievements. Neil Gorsuch on the Supreme Court, and here's a technical discussion of 13 rules that have been uh, overturned. And so that's, that's a pretty significant gap, I would think, in, in levels of achievement. But it is an achievement, and it is one that has involved coordination across Congress and the executive branch. And I don't know if you count the stock market because it's actually gone up quite high in the time since in those 100 days. Uh, it's achieved a new uh, high and moved forward. Now, we often cause out causality here that it's what happened in government that tends to shape what the stock market does. I'm not sure that that's always the case, but I think Trump would claim that yes. this has been one of his... Uh, major accomplishments and that it's going to be on the rise. I think the fact that there was very minuscule growth in the first quarter is very frustrating, but as we know, that's always revised, higher generally. Uh, so I think, and he's brought jobs, held jobs in the United States, right? So. I have a little different spin on that. All right. <laughs> I'm sure. So let's get the real answer. The real answer is. It's always about the money, follow the money. And the stock market is a book, is a gamble, is a bookmaker's gamble on tomorrow's profits. And there's only 30 companies that are listed in what we still call a Dow. And those companies are highly proficient, profit-geared companies. So you can't always go, you have to look at the indexes. You have to look at different other values and determine how this thing is going to play out in terms of Trump making business-like decisions. The one good thing about it is he's a business guy and he understands profit. Okay, he's gone through some serious bankruptcy liquidation concerns and he's able to manage it up. So the stock market is not always indicative of what's going on at the White House. It's based on the profitability of drugs. I'll give you one other thought. The value of buying another company in the merger acquisition world is buying tomorrow's profits. That's how you value that company. So let's move on to those other questions. Yes. Well, maybe you can just <laughs> Thank you each so much for your area of expertise. Uh, I don't know if you happen to plan it on this day, but today is Niccolo Machiavelli's birthday. So, uh, that's kind of interesting. It's 1469, and I know he was given a bad rap for the prince, but uh, uh, at any rate, the uh, point, though, uh, the two questions I have, uh, it seems to me, as Marie especially mentioned, but all of you alluded to, with the uh, compromised or the confusing way that uh, Trump has been able to use the media, uh, certainly, many of us have referenced, again, the 1984, not so much for the totalitarian state, but more for the newspeak idea. And uh, the whole thing about language seems so important to reconsider. I don't know how we, how you can help us reconsider language and uh, that terrific essay at the end of uh, 1984 on the three parts of newspeak. Uh, and secondly, related to that is, uh, very personal, but I think it might represent many of us who think uh, we obviously want success for this nation and the world. We obviously want good foreign policy, care for the poor, et cetera, et cetera, commitments. So we're rooting for something good to happen. At the same time, uh, having the emotional feeling, which uh, I'm not proud to admit, of uh, what McConnell said when Obama was elected, we've got to see Trump as a one-term president. So I'm trying to hold those two in opposition. How do I root for the country, support <laughs> certain policies, uh, and yet feel so uh, opposed to so much that we see? I think you've got to divide yourself in half. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll take the second part of that first, I guess. I'm, not a, I'm no expert here. but. Um, I think you have to have, you have to support institutions. I mean, the presidency is only one aspect of uh, our political life here. And I think you're seeing a lot of uh, public uh, demonstrations, protests. Yeah, I certainly see a lot more letters to the editor these days. Um, people are getting involved. People are 
speaking up and they are supporting institutions like that they believe in like public education public health care immigration refugees so uh, I think there's there's things that people can do as citizens that uh, support the country without necessarily supporting a president that you don't agree with um, but you know clearly we want we want the president to succeed because if he <coughs> fails that's a failure for our country so I, I think that's true who else we got here well, okay. I, I just wanted to say that I also think one of the things that happened in this past election there are 83 million young people under the age of 30. 83 million, the largest group, even bigger than the baby boomers. And they fell in love with Bernie Sanders. And they did not, they were the ones that stayed at home and didn't vote. They're the ones you see coming out of the woodwork, actually, to try to use the political process to have some impact on what's going on. Uh, at the Maxwell School, we now have a major, actually, in citizenship. And one of the interesting things is this, the staff of uh, Congress that's come out with this uh, statement about being indivisible, but actually working very hard, calling, interacting with, forcing representatives to have meetings with their, their constituents. Uh, I think to some extent that's one of the positives of Donald Trump's election, is that it has mobilized a large number of us to think about how do we have an impact. And my hope is that, in effect, it's not just to protest, but that we think about what are the policies that we would like to have an impact on. And we move to actually involve ourselves in the process. Because I've been very impressed with the students that have now and are engaging. Uh, they're learning a lot, but they're also trying to deal with the issues that they think are important to them. Uh, but I do think we need to also take them into account because they are the largest group. And there need to be thoughts about what do we do with student loan debt and this kind of thing. Which Sanders was very <laughs> prompt to say some things that should be done. And that's one of the disappointments. And the big question in my mind has always been, if Hillary had chosen Bernie Sanders as her vice president, would we be in a different world today? Is it time for a third part? <laughs> Actually, well, I was going to say, on, on that point, one thing that's, that's absolutely critical, maybe speaking to Dave's invocation of Machiavelli and mute speak and double think, uh, is uh, if you think about one of the essential, like, what are the essential conditions for a democracy? What do you actually need to have? Right? Do you need to have a Supreme Court? Lots of countries don't. Right? Do you need to have that? Do you need to have a president? Well, there are democracies that don't have a president. Um, and political scientists who thought about this, one essential condition seems to be competition. You need to have competition, competitive elections. That, that'll take care of a lot of other things. And so uh, the important thing to think about is not just is, say, the Trump administration or Trump himself trying to change the meaning of words in a way that's uh, convenient for him. So the reappropriation of the term fake news, for example, any negative poll, that's fake news. Uh, the job report that was children need to grow fake news, right? <laughs> right? So you can say like, oh, that's dangerous, right? Because it's a corruption in our language. But he's, even though his words are influential and have weight, he's not the only person speaking. Uh, what's important is if we have an environment in which we have multiple voices. It's true in campaigns. In any campaign, each side is trying to spin like crazy and change the meaning of everything so it serves their interests. But the bad luck they face is they always, I mean, they have an opponent who's doing the exact opposite, right? So I, I think it's important to keep in mind the broader environment um, and the degree to which we have competition, which doesn't mean that we have to have equal numbers of representatives from each party in government, which we do not, right? We are living in an era right now of, of consolidated uh, broad Republican control at every level uh, of government. But we need to have competition. We need to have competitive voices in our public affairs. We need to have meaningful competition in our elections. And so long as we have that, then I'm less concerned about the self-serving rhetoric um, and uh, 
maybe they're not, I mean, sometimes they're lies, sometimes it's just not full disclosure of the truth. I'm less worried about that if we have that healthy competition. And that, I think, connects with Marie's point about institutions. Right? The institutions are designed to compete with one another. Uh, they're, because they compete and conflict that ultimately we get policy that's in the common interest. But it's through conflict that we achieve um, uh, good government. And so I think it's worth keeping that in mind. Before we go to wrap, a couple of announcements. As some of you know, I will not be here for two weeks. Keep your fingers crossed, and hopefully everything is going to work out the way we hope it will be. <laughs>